since uh, it was called to order last night before convening an executive session. And today's public meeting is scheduled until 10 a.m. I am going to ask Regent Pacheco to lead us in the pledge, please. Mm -hmm. oh. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So our meeting structure this week is a little bit different than our typical pattern. We are going to address the majority of the agenda items, including tuition setting tomorrow morning. This morning, we're going to dedicate some time to a growing and important issue, medical education. For the last year, the board has been working to define the scope of this issue. And today we wanted to start the process of defining solutions. So looking back at the mid 1960s, Arizona was a growing prosperous state of about 1.6 million people. It was also a state in need. Just 55 years from its founding, Arizona had yet to establish sufficient infrastructure and core institutions to continue its early prosperity. And in many ways, our state is still on the frontier. Fortunately for us living in Arizona today, key leaders stepped forward to lay the foundations of our modern state. Of particular note to all of us gathered here today was Dr. Merlin Monty Duvall, one such leader who focused his dreams on an Arizona medical school. It took his visionary leadership and years of effort and a one vote victory at the state legislature and the dedication of an entire community to build what stands here today in Tucson. Now the medical school has reached its mid fifties. And once again, Arizona is in a moment of need. I'd like to turn this over to Regent Duvall, son of Dr. Duvall, and President Robbins, who's a visionary national health care leader and the right person to guide us in the achievement of transforming Arizona health. Regent Duvall. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this conversation lights me up. Um, it is uh, such an important day for the University of Arizona and for the city of Tucson and to some extent the Duval family who celebrates this uh, incredibly exciting new chapter in health science in, Ari in Arizona. Um, I, I wanna give some, some minute of historical context to this. Um, the landing of the medical school in Tucson is obviously what, what brought our family to Arizona in 1963, in early 1964. And the notion that this hard scrabble community of then 240,000 people could build a fully formed academic medical center over the course of decades was viewed as audacious, unthinkable, but the community was galvanized by it in ways that I, I can barely describe. Everyone was involved for a very important reason. The Arizona legislature didn't provide any money to get it started. A story which has unfortunately been familiar with lots of things that we do in higher education. And so this, rather you know, modest sized community was tasked with raising the money for a medical school. Now, I, I've gone and I've gone through all the ar archives. Every single donation was featured on the front page of the Arizona Daily Star. Now, admittedly, it helped that the fundraising chair was the publisher of the Star, pretty smart move. But when I say that it galvanized the community, I, I liken it back to one story, which I'd like to share. One day, my, my dad and I drove into a gas station at the corner of Country Club and Speedway. And the guys in the repair bay were kind of pointing at him. And one of the guys came out and said, are you the doctor that's starting the medical school? And he said, yes, I am. He said, well, doctor, we have something for you. He went inside and all of the guys came out with a greasy Folgers coffee can filled with coins. And they said, we've been pooling our tips. And every time you come for gas, we want to replenish what we can for this incredible transformative moment in Tucson uh, to take the University of Arizona into health sciences. That's the level of significance that this medical school has had uh, in, in all of the, the time since. And so as the chair just reflected, where are we now? Uh, Arizona is growing, our workforce needs uh, and the gap between the doctors, nurses, allied health and all of the other professionals and the needs is only growing. We are in the bottom quartile uh, in terms of our percentage per capita relationship of workforce to need. 
any one of us who's tried to get a doctor's appointment can attest personally to the way in which that reality plays itself out. Secondly, Arizona is poised now to move from a good B plus bioscience leadership to the A leagues. Yesterday, the Flynn Foundation had a terrific presentation on the 20th year of the bioscience roadmap. Tucson's Mayor uh, Rahina Romero was one of the presenters talking about the level of excitement, the amount of Tech Launch Arizona activity, Fletcher McCusker and others that are, are driving the Tucson component of that, obviously uh, happening in a big way uh, in Phoenix in, in many respects. So the bioscience piece is poised and ready. The research piece it is coming along. It was always envisioned that this university would become a national leader in research. And it has, but what we are doing today takes it to another level, uh, which will enable Arizona faculty and Arizona researchers to uh, identify the cures of the future and make them available to Tucsonans. And that's the most important part. This was a uniquely a college of medicine that was launched by, supported by, and cheerleaded by the citizens of this city. And the service component of providing the best possible health care, the best possible cures uh, to more uh, Tucsonans and enough doctors to meet their needs, it requires us to take this next step. And so whether Dr. Dake and President Robbins, whether this is phase three or phase four, it is a significant next step in meeting the original aspirations for this becoming one of America's leading healthcare uh, systems and educators of medical uh, professionals. And although I don't know that it was explicit, the regents who had the great wisdom of recruiting Bobby Robbins to be president of this university must have known this day was going to come because his unique ability, history as a health professional, a world-renowned surgeon, a leader of, uh, of health institutions, makes him not just the right leader for this university writ large, but specifically the right leader to take the health sciences strategy into uh, the full aspiration uh, of the founders um, some 60 years ago. So uh, as the right guy at the right time with the right vision, I want to say thank you, President Robbins, for what you're about to walk us through. And thank you, Pres uh, uh, Mike Dake and, and the team uh, for uh, realizing uh, in full bloom the aspirations uh, that existed uh, 60 years ago. Mr. Okay. President. Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the beautiful campus of the University of Arizona. I want to start by thanking the Regents for giving me, uh, I think it's 30 minutes, uh, to present what I think is an exciting uh, vision that we have for the future of health and wellness for the state of Arizona. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank the individuals that helped me put this presentation together, and sadly to say that the thousands and thousands of slides and videos that we have in a giant box uh, got left on the cutting room floor. So I want to start by saying that uh, with our land acknowledgement, we re respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of ind indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is the home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being the home to the Otum and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community services. So, Regent Duvall, I did not know that you were going to give that uh, preamble, and I appreciate that. So much of what you said, I can probably leave, leave out of, uh, of my slide. I've enjoyed reading uh, the book about your father and reading, uh, I have a book about the history of the, the medical school uh, that someone gave me. And so I've read through that. Um, but I, I also had a hologram that we were working on to have your father speak, but people tell me, yeah, that, uh, you know, cut that out. But I, I wanna give it to you. I wanna give it to you because, uh, it, it, it would have been him saying in his own voice, which has been a little bit uh, creepy. <laughs> creepy is the word that people used and why it didn't make it in. Uh, but to just say, um, yeah, in 1964, just to reiterate, uh, uh, Dr. Merlin Duvall 
brought his talents to Tucson and he arrived on the scene. And as uh, Regent Duvall said, in a short time, uh, he, he arrived here with a, with a what I'm calling a hundred year vision for, for improving the health of Arizonans. Um, he arrived with no land, no money, no buildings, but for this charismatic visionary surgeon, uh, no problem. He went on in three short years, and I, I would love to hear how, how he actually got this done, but in three short years, uh, opened the inaugural class uh, in the first medical school in the state. And by 1971, just four additional years, he opened a hospital. That is truly a remarkable feat. So, uh, you know, I also had, also had a slide, you know, it's about 55 years, depending on you. And, and uh, it was the Sammy Hagar uh, song, I Can't Drive 55. So for us to, uh, in the next 40 years, to really realize your father's uh, 100-year vision, we can't go 55 in, anymore. We've got to go Mach 5. And I think if, uh, you know, if he were here talking to us today, he would say, you've got to do even more, even though so much has been accomplished in the last 60 years. So we, we've got an extraordinary foundation of which we can build upon. Uh, we'll follow our mission and values to guide us uh, for our aspirational goals. But Tucson remains the epicenter for many reasons uh, of, uh, of our healthcare uh, enterprise. I, I will say parenthetically that Dr. Duvall was also one of the early strong advocates for the medical school in Phoenix as well. So we have these two medical schools, but we have a world-class research university uh, that over the last uh, 60 years since the health sciences has been in Tucson has grown. There've been collaborations across colleges and we have a few examples for that. And I think we're uniquely positioned as well. We're the only AAU land grant Hispanic serving university with more than 20,000 students, two medical schools, colleges of nursing, public health, pharmacy, and a new school of health sciences coming on board. So that, that uniquely positions us. Also, we have a veterinary school, which those, the, the, the collection of those assets is truly unique. And it's a model for delivering an innovative care system throughout the state of Arizona. So just imagine with me for a moment, if we could inspire children to become interested in the health sciences, to prevent diseases before they happen, for the ability to connect every citizen of Arizona to get health care, to work on solving the opioid epidemic, to detect cancer early and even prevent some cancers. These are the things that, uh, that we think are a bold vis vision for the future, but it's something that we're doing right now today. We're delivering tomorrow's care today. So clearly, articulated, our aspirational vision is to advance the frontier of health and wellness in Arizona and beyond by building the most innovative, world-class academic healthcare network. So there are three components to every academic medical center. There's the teaching, discovery, and care component. I think we have the found foundation for building uh, a way to prepare our students for the, to be the next generation of healthcare workers. We have the university and many departments that uh, have fundamental discoveries that are being translated into the clinic to use to, uh, to care for patients every day. This is Dr. Jeff Gertner, who is the chair of surgery, who was recently recruited from Stanford University, talking about what he envisions as the future of the academic medical center. I think the academic medical center of the future is going to have to be more nimble and efficient than the academic medical centers of the past. We're going to need to merge the tripartite mission of patient care, research, and education into more of a continuum with the patient at the center. We will provide state-of-the-art medical care to patients uh, for things we don't have solutions for. We will involve them in clinical trials and will inspire and educate the next generation of practitioners. So the first step is how we educate the next generation of uh, health and wellness providers. 
And I, I think we do this better than any place I've ever been, which is a, a curriculum that is focused on interdisciplinary uh, 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 training of our health science providers. So physicians, nurses, um, technicians all train alongside each other because when you go into the real world, that's how it works. And we do this in what I will tell you is the most advanced health simulator in the world, right here on the campus in the, in the Health Sciences Innovation Building. I'm also happy to report that on May 4th, just two weeks from today, there'll be a groundbreaking for the new JTED High School for the Health Sciences at the Bridges. Uh, this will be a, uh, a place that will, that will focus on encouraging high school students from the Tucson, Sunnyside, and Amphi uh, school districts to think about uh, having a, a, a career in health sciences and to be able to not only encourage, but support them to, to that goal. Uh, this is particularly important, of course, as, as uh, Regent Duvall said, we're facing a catastrophic healthcare crisis. And I know Dr. Duvall would be particularly proud of this day because he was an early advocate for getting rural and underprivileged high school students involved in healthcare education with the MedStart program that he founded and uh, continues to be funded to this day. So I want you to watch and listen. These are scenes right out of uh, Aztec, the Arizona Simulation Technology and Education Center of how we're training the next generation of uh, healthcare providers to be able to uh, manage an ICU patient, learn how to deliver a baby, uh, become pr proficient in endotracheal intubation, and to actually be able to learn how to take out a gallbladder laparoscopically before they ever see a patient. So gone are the days of the uh, the see one, do one, teach one, uh, learning in the clinic to being able to do it by simulation. Hello, my name is Marissa Lovett, and I'm a third year medical student and research assistant here at the University of Arizona Health Sciences. Today, I would like to welcome you to the Arizona Simulation Technology and Education Center, better known here at the University of Arizona as Aztec. Housed in our Health Sciences Innovation Building, Aztec also has satellite locations within the Banner University Hospital. It's hard to believe that what began as an ambitious teaching project in a 425 square foot room in the Department of Surgery has grown into one of the top simulation and skill practice environments in the country. Our Executive Director, Dr. Alan Hamilton, is dedicated to the elimination of preventable errors from our healthcare system. His vision for reaching that goal, a multidisciplinary facility capable of simulating any healthcare environment or procedure, is now a tangible reality. Stopped. The really good part is you're actually going to see a laparoscopic cholecystectomy being done. Hmm. That's too bad. I want to go back and try. Uh, can't do that. Okay. Well, come to come to Aztec, and we can teach all of you how to remove a gallbladder uh, laparoscopically. It's like playing a video game. Our mission is that no patient will ever suffer a preventable error. Now that's a big a big goal, but without a facility like Aztec, you're never going to get close to it. So we had this, this mission of let's make sure we can reproduce everything. Reproduce breast is. exam, prostate letter. exam, endoscopy, a bronchoscopy, laparoscopy, surgery, anesthesia, delivery. So every single one of those aspects, we said, okay, we're going to focus on that. Aztec is an architectural marvel. You know, here you have what the, a world-class center, 45,000 square feet. People are coming from all over the country to see it. When I look at this, I go, this is the University of Arizona at its very best. When we built the, uh, the first real simulation center, modern simulation center at Stanford, we had 15,000 square feet about 20 years ago. I thought nobody will ever uh, come close to this thing. 
we have 45,000 square feet. I've been all over the world. That is absolutely the best simulation center uh, that I've ever seen. So as we as we turn to the to the uh, from the the preparation and education to the uh, healing and care side of the, the equation. This is Dr. Andrew Weil, and we're turning the uh, the dirt on the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine that is under construction and should be open in the next uh, few months. Uh, Dr. Weil is a world-renowned uh, uh, leader and pioneer in the in the world of integrative medicine. We're so blessed to have him here at the University of Arizona. I'd studied his work for years and years. When I finally got to meet him, I said, I want to come see your center. He said, don't get excited. It's in a little adobe house off campus. So I told him at that point, we have to build you a center. So I'm incredibly proud of the, of the work that Andy's been able to accomplish. And now as we, as we turn toward the equation toward preventing disease, uh, integrative health is, is going to become a main part of the mainstream healthcare and will be a part of the practice of every physician uh, going forward. And it started right here in Arizona, and we continue to, uh, to amplify and accelerate. We're also, by nature, at our core caregivers. Uh, we were the only uh, comprehensive, NCI-designated comprehensive cancer center in this nearly 250 uh, million square miles of land east of west of Dallas, east of Los Angeles, and south of Denver. Uh, Dr. Uh, the, the, the Cancer Center was just um, uh, recertified by the NCI uh, and, uh, for a 10-year certification. And, and the, the programs that are highlighted uh, in the Cancer Center's application uh, are prevention. Prevention is a real mainstay of, uh, of what we do at the Cancer Center, cancer center here in, in Arizona. Uh, moreover, in addition to focusing on research and education of patients, there's care and uh, there's a collaboration between the Cancer Center uh, and engineering around cancer engineering. Just imagine a tumor being extracted, being genotyped, put on a semiconductor chip and analyzed to get a personalized, customized treatment plan for that patient and to use uh, high throughput uh, screening to be able to discover new drugs for cancer. Um, we're very proud of our cancer center, and we're gonna, we think that uh, as part of this grand vision over the next 40 years, it'll grow even larger. Also, there are other things that are listed here, the major diseases that uh, cause disability and death uh, in the world are listed. I, I think particularly we need to reclaim our national and international position, uh, for instance, in heart transplantation and the use of artificial hearts. Um, the first real large-scale program for total artificial heart use was right here at the University of Arizona. The first time I came to Tucson, uh, I was to interview for a cardiac surgery position, and I made rounds with Jack Copeland, and I uh, walked by. The first patient I saw was a patient named Michael Drummond, who just eight hours earlier uh, Jack Copeland had put a total artificial heart in. He was sitting up having a seven up. And I thought, well, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty wild. It, it, for, it uh, caused Syncardia, the only company that makes total artificial, uh, total artificial hearts, uh, to be here uh, in, in Tucson. So there are many things, many clinical programs that we're growing and that we need to, uh, to double down on and uh, continue to grow. Uh, this is Dr. James Liao. He is recently recruited to be our chair of medicine. I would say you can't have a great academic medical center without great chairs of surgery and medicine. Dr. Liao started his uh, career at uh, Harvard with Peter Libby, the world famous cardiologist, and then was recruited here from the University of Chicago, where he served as chief of cardiology. He's going to talk about uh, the future of uh, healthcare delivery and prevention. There's a real opportunity that we have today uh, to employ many of the things that are currently are in play or will be coming, such as telemedicine and remote monitoring. Uh, this will allow the physicians to take care of patients, not only in the hospital, in their clinics, but also in their homes. I think going forward, this will allow the physician to prevent disease, which I think will be the focus 
of healthcare, uh, not the treatment. Patients don't want to get sick and be treated. Patients don't want to get sick at all. Yeah, I think that's uh, very true. Um, and, and he's starting to uh, move us into a uh, into the fourth industrial revolution here, the convergence of physical, biological, and digital sciences. And uh, prevention and connecting uh, and giving access to all Arizonans uh, will be a continued part of this presentation. There are 77,000 babies born in the state of Arizona every year, and we have an absolute true pioneer clinical uh, scientist uh, that heads up our pediatric uh, program at the University of Arizona. Uh, Dr. Gaia, uh, Dr. Fayez uh, Gishan is truly a real life Dr. House. Uh, I have had so many families come up to me and tell me that they had taken their baby everywhere uh, in the country and finally came to Tucson where Dr. Gishan used a combination of genomics and proteomics to make a diagnosis and a treatment plan. So he's a, uh, he's a absolute uh, treasure for us in Arizona. And, and not only uh, are we uh, giving cutting edge care to, to pediatric patients, we have the only fetal surgery program. So even before babies are born, uh, we're, we're operating on them, doing uh, opening up the uterus and repairing defects in fetuses. For instance, uh, diaphragmatic hernias, where the, uh, the abdominal contents go into the chest, the lung doesn't develop normally. They have uh, uh, problems with respiratory failure when they're born. You can go in uh, during the fetal time, uh, open up the abdomen, pull the uh, intestines down, close the defect in the diaphragm, and let the baby go back and develop normally, <clears throat> and they have a better chance of survival. Moreover, uh, spina bifida can be diagnosed in utero and repaired. So again, in this in this area of the Southwest, we're the only program and it uh, ve sounds very futuristic, but it's happening every day right here at the University of Arizona. Almost every uh, uh, one knows about and many individuals and families have been devastated by the opioid crisis. As part of our strategic planning investment, uh, we invested in a 20 year program uh, at the University of Arizona uh, focused on pain and addiction and created the Comprehensive Pain and Addiction Center. That center went on to uh, win uh, a good return on investment because the next year won a $25 million uh, NIH grant to support this work. And then uh, fortuitously, uh, Oklahoma State University, as part of the Purdue Pharmaceutical Settlement, got $200 million uh, it, to the uh, Oklahoma State University uh, to, to research uh, opioid uh, addiction and pain management. Um, Oklahoma State had one investigator that had knew of our work and had collaborated with us over the years and called and said, do you wanna, you wanna help us do this work? Because we don't have any uh, uh, in vivo animal models and this is something you've been doing for 20 years. So of course we said yes. And um, in addition to the $200 million in the settlement, Purdue Pharmaceuticals gave Ohio, uh, Ohio State, Oklahoma State University, a 10,000 uh, compound library of lead candidates that could uh, help develop the world's first non-opioid, non-addictive medication. So we are confident that in the next couple of years, as part of this grand vision, uh, we will have medications that are that are developed right here. Uh, in combination with Oklahoma State to solve the opioid crisis. So all of this stuff sounds like uh, science fiction, uh, but it's actually happening today. And I, I just wanted to use this uh, couple of examples of this. This is Dr. Uh, Claire Carriel, who uh, was a recipient of the Arizona uh, Bioscience and in, in, uh, Researcher of the Year a few years ago, I think the first year I got here. And you can see her using this magic wand to look at skin lesions of patients. She's a world-renowned dermatologist. Uh, that device can let her, instead of just looking at it and saying, well, looks like a melanoma. I think you need to have a biopsy or have it taken out. She could use this device that she uh, developed in collaboration with Optical Sciences College here uh, on the campus 
to identify skin lesions that uh, to tell whether it was benign or, or cancerous. Uh, more recently, she's used uh, uh, refine this to simply use an iPhone to take a picture of these lesions and then employ uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to be able to decide, is this a cancer or is it benign? And we'll just watch it. She's also developing a statewide uh, registry and database uh, to address skin cancers in the state of Arizona, which is clearly a big problem for our state. This is Dr. Jennifer Barton who um, is the director of Bio5, another Arizona Bio uh, Scientist of the Year uh, award winner. And, and she's showing a phalloposcope that she developed in collaboration with bioengineering, optical science, and the College of Medicine to diagnose ovarian cancer earlier in high-risk patients. The problem with ovarian cancer is oftentimes it's diagnosed too late uh, when it's already spread throughout the body. So this is another great example of collaboration across the colleges uh, between medicine, engineering, uh, and optical sciences. Um, the, the picture on the right is a decellularized pig heart. So why would you do that? Well, the idea is to provide a scaffold where you could use your own cells. Uh, you could take a blood sample, you can convert those cells into inducible pluripotent stem cells and differentiate them toward a cardiac lineage and reanimate that pig heart and use it as a replacement organ. That sounds crazy, but that's stuff that's going on here in the next video will uh, we'll give you a little insight into it. Not only can we address heart failure, but diabetes, spinal cord injury, and Parkinson's disease with advanced uh, cellular therapies. Uh, Dr. Warheim, uh, Wertheim and I were on the same flight coming back from DC yesterday, where he was at an NIH uh, uh, meeting where he is decellularizing uh, li animal livers and kidneys right here at Arizona and repopulating them with iPS cells. Restorative and regenerative medicine uh, has the promise to uh, build new cells uh, using genetic technologies to repair genetic defects, uh, introduce new curative genes through vectors uh, into cells, and possibly even one day building new designer cell types to cure diseases such as cancer. We may be even uh, able to uh, repopulate organs with curative cellular uh, technologies and uh, repopulate structures with uh, new cells to, uh, to cure disease and build new organs to patients who need them. So Dr. Wertheim, Dr. Joanne Sweezy, the head of our cancer center and I were all on the same flight coming back. So we, uh, they, they helped me out with this presentation on the plane last night. So uh, I've told you a lot about what has been developed over the last 60 years. Now I'd like to look a little more toward the future. Um, certainly you, you started to hear about fourth industrial revolution, digitalization. Uh, I think the key to our vision over the next 40 years that we uh, think will happen is that there has to be digital connectivity for everyone. Uh, we have to amplify our uh, telemedicine program, which is one of the most extensive and oldest in the world. Uh, it's truly a leader in telemedicine. And I think the pandemic has shown you, I don't know how many times you uh, you visited your doctor on FaceTime with your iPhone, uh, but it's becoming more and more uh, something that we're going to have to do as we uh, connect everyone digitally. Uh, the other uh, issue is that uh, think about when you have to go for a second opinion. Um, and you have to go and you get your medical records uh, scanned and copied. You have to take it to your uh, referring physician or your angiogram or whatever it is. There is already in existence a Arizona Health Information Exchange, and uh, we're going to we're going to double down on that um, so that if you're a patient seen with chest pain in Yuma and you go to Scottsdale for a second opinion, all your records are easily easily accessible in this health information exchange. And here uh, is an example of a biostamp. Uh, Dr. Marv Slepian is developing these devices here at the University of Arizona. And this uh, device is connected to the cell phone and that can then be connected to uh, physicians and hospitals and clinics all over the state and literally all over the world. So this biostamp will, will give data on uh, uh, blood pressure, heart rate, actually an EKG, um, 
sodium potassium levels uh, movement so that you can track Parkinson's patients using the internet of things. You can, uh, as Dr. Liao was saying, treat patients in their home. So we see this as a big part of, uh, of the future. We already have a, a rural public health network that has been built over the last 60 years. And it's one where we have connectivity and uh, rotations for our students, trainees, and doing research out in the field. So we don't have to start from scratch. We already have these sites in over, uh, over 100 locations across the state of Arizona. We envision over the next 40 years, we will provide uh, care uh, from the epicenter here at Tucson, but also using our College of Medicine in Phoenix to, to develop a statewide network that builds on the access that we've already built over the last 60 years. And it's not just in these rural health clinics uh, and underserved area clinics, but just in Phoenix alone, we have uh, collaborative clinical partners with Banner, with the VA, with Valleywise, with Phoenix Children's, with Common Spirit. Uh, we have great relationships uh, with hospitals in, in, uh, in Yuma, uh, Nogales, Sierra Vista, Casa Grande, all the way up to Flagstaff. So we see this as a statewide uh, clinical delivery network that values the, uh, the discovery and education mission that the University of Arizona brings. One Health is a convergence of human, animal health, and environmental sciences. And because we're a land-grant university and have cooperative extension programs in every county in the, in the state, we see the, uh, the mobilization and convergence of healthcare providers, veterinarians, uh, research scientists going out in the community to provide health at that level. Also, by understanding with the one of the world's best hydrology and atmospheric science programs in the uh, in, in the university, uh, we believe that water is going to be a critical issue uh, in the healthcare of uh, not only animals but humans in the future, and potentially have the uh, insight to predict and maybe even prevent future. Uh, pandemics. I, I envision that uh, the state of Arizona will have a multi-institutional translational research center somewhere in the state. It would, uh, it would be a chance for all three of our public universities to come together uh, to marshal our resources and, and to work together and not compete with the rest of the world uh, to advance discoveries that can be translated into the clinical care of patients for the discovery of new drugs and vaccines, medical devices, uh, digital health platforms, and even biotechnology. I, I think that this uh, uh, would be a center that would be surrounded by uh, companies, whether they be multinational uh, conglomerates or startup companies that would come because the science and the discoveries that are being made uh, are, are so important. Uh, it would be surrounded by hotels, restaurants, conference centers, and housing. I, I see this actually being in Pinal County, uh, just south of the airport, where we have a 2,800 acre uh, agricultural park. We already have uh, plans in conjunction with the city of Maricopa to develop a uh, tech park there. And I think one day uh, this could be the centerpiece of that tech park could even have a hospital attached to it. And the final thing uh, is to, to look to the future. I think if you look at the last 25 years, in my opinion, the most uh, fundamental discovery for advancing health and wellness has been mapping the human genome. If I look forward for the next 25 years, I think it's mapping the human immunome. Uh, we know a lot about immunology, but we're just scratching the surfaces. So the Center for Advanced Molecular and Immunolo Immunolo Immunology Therapies or Immunological Therapies um, uh, will be built at the Phoenix uh, Bioscience Corps. Uh, it will be a collaboration with uh, ASU, NAU, TGEN, and others. And I think it will be focused on uh, things like cancer, uh, uh, Jim Allison won the Nobel Prize for Immunotherapies for Cancer in 2017 at MD Anderson. It'll focus on inflammation, which is common to most cardiovascular and neurodegenerative diseases. It'll focus on transplant immunology, uh, on um, 
uh, autoimmune diseases such as diabetes, lupus, uh, scleroderma, and rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, aging is becoming more uh, evident that the immune system plays a role in aging. And then finally, and obviously in infectious diseases. We think because of our uh, world-renowned astronomy program, program and our very specific partnerships with uh, non-governmental space exploration companies that we can be the uh, provider for space care, uh, helping NASA uh, space travelers make their journeys uh, safer. But we're really focused on being the go-to provider for the companies that are non-government funded uh, that will go into space exploration. I think you saw today SpaceX uh, just launched their lar the largest rocket in the history. Uh, second? Uh, well, I think they blew it up on purpose because there was supposed to be a design separation and it didn't quite work, but they, they got it off the ground. <laughs> Well, as long as they meant to do it, that's different. Yeah. Well, I think it was a, well, we can talk about that and discuss it here. Uh, but but we think we can be the go-to provider to to do pre-flight pre screening and physicals, um, to put in preventative therapies uh, and measures such as radiation shielding and strategies to prevent osteoporosis, and then to provide even in-flight uh, medical treatment. So that that may sound a little bit far out, but in summary, um, uh, what, what it means uh, to to work together to improve the digital connectivity to all Arizonans is part of our grand vision. Uh, together, we'll improve the health and wellness of humanity, one patient, one community, and one county at a time. Uh, we'll create a beacon for health and healing uh, through science, care, and compassion. We'll convert cancer to a chronic manageable disease and we'll serve even pioneers in space travel. So our, our overarching vision over the next 40 years as I see it is to advance the frontier of health and wellness in Arizona and beyond and to be a model for, for other states and other countries even uh, of how you can use an academic medical center uh, with fundamental discovery, translate those discoveries to improve the health of uh, individuals and communities. The so-called find a problem, a clinical problem in the clinic, go to the lab and bring those discoveries back to solve the problem in the clinic. And we'll do this by building the most innovative statewide academic healthcare system in the country. And so for the drop the mic video, I'll go to the next one. Drop the clicker. <laughs> Maybe I have to click it again. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, President Robbins. That was inspiring is the first word that comes to mind. Um, I mean, I'm excited. Does the board have any comments or questions for President Robbins? We're all in stunned silence. Um, I have one question and I think it's it's inherent in what you presented to us, but can you talk a little bit, one of the things that, that was made obvious was the lack of, or the, the gap between the need of medical students, need of medical providers and um, what we currently have in the state. And if we're not growing that number, given that the state is growing, we're only going to fall further behind. Can you talk a little bit about what you're planning or what the plans are for um, enrollments in the medical school? Yeah, so we, we've said uh, uh, pretty clearly we would like to double the number of medical students that uh, we're producing both in Tucson and Phoenix. And as I've said, I think every all the other universities, uh, Creighton is here, I think Every other university should be thinking about how we can increase uh, the uh, the production of all uh, health and wellness providers in the state, because otherwise we're going to have to go out and import them into the state. And it's better to start with a middle schooler in uh, Sunnyside uh, uh, Middle School in the district there and encourage them to become a doctor or a nurse or a pharmacist and then bring them along and we grow our own. You know, you can you can go out and, uh, and, and get players in the free agent market or you can develop great farm systems. And I think that, that unfortunately we're, we're doing both right now. We need to grow our own because it's more likely if you are from Arizona, you train here. Uh, certainly if you do your residency, there's a likelihood you'll stay in the state. So in addition to students, We've got to increase GME spots as well. Chair Manson. Yes. Dr. Robinson. Same with nursing. Uh, a little bit on the nursing side, certainly to expand the, the medical school to uh, attract that farm system of folks here in Arizona to keep them here. But your thoughts on the nursing school and, and that, that expansion and its capabilities. Yeah, I just toured the nursing school. And um, by the way, it was the first college in the health sciences here. Uh, predated uh, the medical school and uh, others. Um, they, they're they just out of space. I mean, there's so many applicants and they just don't have the physical uh, facilities to uh, to build, build uh, to, to uh, be able to train uh, nurses. So that's something we're going to have to um, address. We've got uh, programs in, in Chandler. That's an incredible program. And um, in Gilbert, sorry. Uh, and, and, you know, that's taken over really a whole building with a simulation center. It looks like a, a hospital floor uh, at their simulation center there. So uh, we've, we've learned a lot from our simulation center. But, uh, you know, there's only uh, so many students that any one university can handle. Uh, and that's why I think everybody has to grow their health sciences programs. Go to President Cruz Rivera and then Regent Mata. I want to commend President Robbins on the University of Arizona community. It's really enlightening to see when we have elite public institutions that understand that there is value in investing in their place, in their space, not only because of what it does to elevate the communities that they serve, the communities that um, really support their work, um, but also because it has a dual a function of serving as a model for other institutions across the country who should be doing the same thing and as well create the opportunities for uh, knowledge transfer so that we can accelerate uh, the work that is so important these days in increasing health well-being and eradicating health disparities across the country so uh, so so proud to be part of uh, this try you effort and and look forward to the work ahead thank you thank you chair Manson. President Robin, thank you for that great presentation and for doing all you do for our community. So my question is, um, for rural area, you already have partnerships with different um, institutions and there are some specialties that are lacking. How do you um, expect or how do you envision that to expand? And also how telemedicine will be expanding to those rural areas because nowadays, the technology play a big um, role 
to be able to help a lot of people, even in those remote areas. And, yeah. and the problems that we have with sometimes with the antennas and technology and how can we reach out to those areas? I, I think it's part of our core mission is to, is to improve the health of all Arizonans throughout the, uh, the state. And so there are certainly areas, uh, Sierra Vista being one, where there may be no neurosurgeon or there may be no OBGYN uh, uh, to deliver babies or maybe only one. And if they're not there, then what happens? So I think increasing these programs are nurse midwifery program is one that I think is going to be very important to help serve uh, underserved communities, either rural or urban. Um, but I also think that telemedicine, for instance, managing an ICU, you can essentially manage an ICU from a central control center anywhere. Uh, you know, we did that all across California from Stanford, and uh, that technology is here, uh, and there are companies that do that all the time. I, I think that that's our mission is to, to be able to uh, offer our services throughout the entire state because there's a value proposition in academic medical centers is that you um, that you do train the next generation of, of uh, providers. You do have the cutting edge translational uh, research uh, opportunities that are not the, the mission of a community hospital. Um, and certainly not for for-profit system, which is only looking at making money. So I, I think it's built into our DNA and, and our mission. And I, I think that, uh, you know, the more I read about Dr. Duvall, his, his raison d'etre was serve the community. Uh, and, and I think he would be proud of what we're thinking about over the next 40 years. Thank you. Rachel Pacheco. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Robbins and team. You guys did a wonderful job, I commend you. I'm curious as to your thoughts on how this impacts healthcare regionally and what you envision um, the impact will be sort of not only outside of Tucson, obviously that's the, the hub of the heart of what, you, um, of what you have, but just broadly, how does that impact the region? Yeah, I think it's to be determined. Um... Because uh, you know we we've got basically four systems in southern Arizona or in Tucson, and and I think there there potentially could be some consolidation uh, in in the region, but I think our our product is a differentiated product. Um, it, it's a place where, as I said uh, to uh, Regent Mata, that um, that is different than going to a community hospital to get your appendix out. The Western United States and um, Northern Mexico? Well, I, I, as I said, we're really the only uh, major academic medical center uh, basically uh, west of Dallas, east of LA, and south of Denver, and certainly down into Mexico, which I see as a huge market. So I think that w this innovative um, system that we're talking about that I'm envisioning for the future will focus first on Arizona, but it will be able to serve. I mean, we're getting, uh, Jack Copeland used to get referrals from all over the world to get the Syncardia artificial heart implanted here. Um, there are going to be cases that come from all over uh, this region uh, in the Southwest for fetal surgery because nobody else is doing it. So I think those destination um, programs that will differentiate us as we look across the entire state. I, I remember when I was a medical student um, because I thought about, well, what other states do this well? Mississippi, you know, is the only academic medical center is the University of Mississippi, and there are a couple of other states, but nobody has really um, thought about and envisioned how you could use technology such as sensors and um, and bio patches and connectivity to deliver this type of care. Uh, so I do think it'll be a model uh, for the future, but I can remember uh, the chair of surgery would always say, we'd hand write these long, you know, 10 page histories and physicals. And the first thing is, uh, you know, Mrs. Smith is a 56 year old woman referred from Dr. Jones in Batesville, Mississippi, because he, you know, it was seen as the place to send cases, particularly for those regions that didn't have the specialist, uh, but also for the more complex cases. We, we used to say at Stanford, we, 
we thought of ourselves as the quarter last resort. That's how I think of us for the tough tertiary and quaternary care cases. So what I'm hearing you saying is that Arizona is really going to become the epicenter of this type of um, function. Well, I, th I think in the future, that, that would be my vision. Really yeah. I, I think also this translational research opportunity is one that's really big. Uh, and it'll attract drug companies, it'll attract uh, medical device, digital health companies, and biotech companies to be here because our universities are great. I mean, we've got incredible, uh, you know, uh, two major that are going to be over a billion dollars in research uh, expenditures a year uh, in the very near future. Uh, two really leading universities and NAU does a lot of work, as particularly in the microbiome and other things. So I, I think if we could come together and say we're not competing against each other, we're competing with the outside world, um, this could be a big part of the future of Arizona. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Robbins, I think you've just touched on something that I'm very passionate about, and I think we have the opportunity with incredible universities here, and, and the anchor presentation that you just provided is to be that corridor, that America's corridor of healthcare. I, I love that you opened up and said, hey, Mexico is a market. I would love to see uh, Arizona think of itself as the hub for the Americas, manufacturing of medical devices, manufacturing uh, uh, of pharmaceuticals, providing health care. I, I think the model that we use uh, through China is, is in, not in our national interest. And I think here in Arizona, we have the chance to attract and deliver not only health care, but the whole continuum of the health care industry. And I think it's upon us to you know take that swing at it. I think uh, a lot of medical companies would love the opportunity to look at our lifestyle and our capabilities. And again, from Central America up through Mexico, through Canada, through this corridor, I think Arizona has a great chance to kind of see and set the tone for the future. So I'm, yep. I'm thrilled to hear that you're not only thinking, you know, here, what's great for Arizona, here's what's great for Southern Arizona, but here's what can happen in Mexico if we look at it. Here's what can happen in New Mexico. Here's what can happen in Colorado. I mean, I think it's great. Yeah, I, I think, you know, as I've always said, Arizona is the future state. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, uh, Arizona has many of the attractive features of both Texas and California, um, in, in my opinion, having lived there recently. Uh, and I think it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to really uh, double, triple, quadruple down on <laughs> semiconductor research, uh, on big data, supercomputing, um, which will be absolutely clear uh, uh, a need for the future of healthcare. Um, and, and the more development on artificial intelligence, quantum networking and computing, which we are very good at at the University of Arizona out of our College of Optical Science, Internet of Things. And um, I also think uh, in terms of autonomous vehicles, um, these are areas that I think all of us can work together on and it can differentiate us, uh, uh, our state from uh, others. And there'll be people from around the world who'll come here. I mean, I, I look at, uh, you know, a place like Mississippi and Alabama. Alabama invested early in space, and Huntsville is going to become the largest city in Arizona. And, uh, you know, we, we need to pick the sectors that we're going to be really good at and invest in them. And I believe that we've got a clear advantage in the health sciences. Thank you. Any final comments or questions? Thank you. That was really, really fabulous. Thank you. Um, this concludes the public portion of today's meeting. We are going to reconvene in executive session at 1030 in the Tucson room for the review of assignments with the Enterprise Executive Committee, President Cruz Rivera and President Crow, and some other items on the executive session agenda. If uh, board members would like to attend the Hopi Old Main Building sign dedication and celebration, cart service is available outside the student union. This event will go on until 5.30 this evening. And then the spring meeting reception is beginning at 6 p.m. in the chemistry building and commons lobby at 1306 East University Boulevard. The cart service is available from the sign dedication and the hotel. For those of you attending the reception this evening at the Chemistry Building and Commons, the shuttle service will be available starting at 5.30. We are scheduled to resume our public meeting tomorrow morning at 8.30 in the North Ballroom right here. 
And then following that public session, the board will reconvene an executive session at 11 a.m. for its review of assignments with President Robbins and other items on the executive mm -hmm. session agenda. The board is now in recess.